You know, when it comes to strapping on the blades, you got your legends and your wannabe legends. That right there, the latter. This guy, well, he's the actual legend. Johan Olaf Koss, one of the best speed skaters of all time. He broke 11 world records. Now, Johan started speed skating when he was just seven years old, and by the age of 19, he was Norway's junior champion. Five years later, in the Olympic Games, 92 winter games in Albertville, France, except on the opening day, Johan had to actually have surgery on an inflamed pancreas, so his Olympic dream was over, right? Well, hell no, just days later, Johan won gold and silver. Two years later, Lillehammer, Johan was even greater. He won all his races in world record time, snagged three top finishes, but that's not all. Before those games, Johan Olaf Koss became an athlete ambassador for Olympic Aid. That's a group that raised money for sports in war-torn countries. Johan even donated part of his Olympic winnings. Now, over the next few years, he traveled to Ethiopia to visit children affected by HIV AIDS. He went to Rwanda with UNICEF to bring these spirits of sport to children, and I uh, was even married to Belinda Stronic for a short time. But back to sports. 2003, Olympic aid became right to play with costs at the forefront. Right to Play has become an internationally recognized non-governmental organization headquartered in Toronto, and what it does is bring sport to underprivileged youth in 23 countries around the world. Ladies and gentlemen, cost the boss. Johan <laughs> Uh, Thank you very much. Um, there, there's so much to talk about uh, with you, but I just for, for those who don't know necessarily what Right to Play is, um, I, I know we, we talk about how you use sport to help in certain areas. Just yeah. explain how you do that. Well, it's very important, I think, for children's development to use sport and play as a tool for education where they can do both physically, psychologically, and socially develop. And, and what we do is actually training local people to become coaches and teachers to implement these educational programs through the games. And it's actually wonderful to see how it changes the spirit of, uh, uh, of a child, how it wants to uh, do really well in their life again. They, want, they understand more the rules and how they have respect for one another. And of course, through our games, they also learn how to protect themselves from diseases like HIV AIDS or other uh, killing diseases and in areas of conflict, they l learn how to do conflict resolution. I, I imagine going to certain parts of the world, you really can't teach them how to speed skate, can you? No, it's, uh, <laughs> it's really bad. Yeah. Uh, but, so what kind it of is, is is soccer? Very, well, yeah, we do a lot of normal sport and soccer and uh, basketball, volleyball, track and field, these things. So what we managed to do is actually build games, like normal games we played when we were kids out, outside with our friends. And we made educational messages around them. And, it, and using those type of games, it actually includes a lot of girls and boys together, which creates a lot of mm -hmm. gender understanding and issues around that, which is excellent. And you can actually connect that to educational outcomes. It's almost like this, this is the next step of aid, in that for, for, for so long it was about food, water, shelter, which is all very important. But I mean, you know how most people on this side of the world, we can't even handle a breakup without seeing a therapist. Um, you know, in other parts of the world, people go through such traumatic events, especially children, and there's not, there was very little psychosocial happening yeah. where you're helping them have fun again and learning it. Is this, the, is this how aid has evolved, addressing more and more needs and concerns? I, you know what, I think it's actually looking at people all around the world as people and particularly children and respecting their needs and knowing that if you can normalize a situation when they've gone through trauma, you will actually potentially become good adults. And that has been forgotten. And that's what I saw when I travel around the world after the Olympics was, um, you know, I coming into refugee camps and realized that children weren't playing. You know, they, they were exposed to violence and sexual abuse and, and lack of education and, and totally lack of hope and, and believes in the future. Is it Eritrea where you went to first? Yes, I, uh, I had a great trip. Uh, actually, that was before the Olympics uh, to Eritrea and 30 years of civil war. Children, uh, you know, have only been accustomed to violence and the role models were the uh, military and, uh, and the people who died in the war. And when I met them, you know, I met this group of boys. One of them were very popular and I was asking why you're so popular and he said, and they all laughed at me and said, long sleeves. I was like, what do you mean? Well, he showed me, showed me, took off his shirt, rolled it together, and the sleeves became a knot, and that's how they could play 
with him. His shirt was the ball oh. to play in the streets. What does the government say when you first walked in? Like when you first landed, that was pre-Olympics, it was Olympic yeah. aid. What, what, what do the, the leaders of a country say to you when you say, hey, we're gonna just play sport here? Well, actually, um, I came after, and it's interesting because the president of Eritrea at the time, after the Olympics, had called for food because it could be a shortage. And I came with the sport and trainers and equipment and things. And I met with him and asked him, I might have brought the wrong thing. And he looked at me and said, you know what? You know, the, the equipment we receive from the Norwegian children is the first time we feel like human beings. Like we are respected for something more than just being kept alive. Mm -hmm. And this is, can give, bring us hope for a peaceful future. And this is the first time my kids can be able to play uh, and to develop properly what we take as for granted. You know, we do it in our communities here in Canada or Norway or anywhere mm -hmm. because we, we think with luxury. This is not luxury. This is exceptionally important. Sport is. Sport and play is, you know, both the physical activity, you know, that ability to actually have a game and play mm -hmm. and be creative and, and develop between each other. I mean, that's, that's very, very important. I wonder what this would do for you personally being involved in this because, I mean, as an Olympic athlete and you had in Lillehammer, you have a home country, you had a massive games. You won, you, your whole life is training for something about you. Yeah. And then the moment those games are done, did you have this void in your life? Yeah. Well, actually, it's interesting. I see a lot of athletes having that problem with uh, accustom themselves to life after sport. It's a, it's a big miss, actually, because you, you always have that goal in the drive and you get also an enormous amount of attention. Um, I was fortunate because I went to medical school at the time mm -hmm. and I knew when I was finished with my games I wanted to become a doctor and I was training to be one. So I kind of had a full day when I got back into normal life. Um, but I think more importantly when I was training was I met these children in Eritrea. And what I realized, what they don't have and I, I have been given and taken for granted. And I get so much more appreciative of my life and trying to do my best out of my own talents and then trying also to give them an opportunity. I like any child that's affected by war or poverty or disease, we should know that we can do something for them and we can do a little bit and we will change the world. We can create a healthier and safer world. And when I saw that, it really inspired me to do, do just something so mm -hmm. we can create a better place. Did you, uh, but even though you had, you had the doctor stuff in, in school to replace it, uh, riding out on such a high, did you have moments where you personally looked around and went, I'm, I'm, sport has to be a big part of my life because I'm missing this? Uh, actually, the, many years, uh, particularly actually four years later in the Olympics in Nagano, I was missing it a lot when you see these yeah. other athletes and you think, okay, I'm supposed to be there. Uh, Did you think, you like, I could beat them. I could absolutely beat them. I still think that. <laughs> <You> still think <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but back then you maybe could have. No, I you couldn't. Know, not anymore, right? I still couldn't that then. Yeah. You know, the day after you quit, it's, uh, it's over. Uh, it's funny with the sport. It's, uh, it's just so things in the moment and you can't do anything. So, um, no, of course, sport is such a great place to be and to, to be participating and enjoying that. Mm -hmm. um, and I miss it. I don't miss it that much anymore because I get so much gratitude and enjoyment through reaching the goals by reaching more children in the world. And now, as you said, we have over half a million children in the program and it's based out of Canada. So this is a Canadian-based organization. You hear so much about how controversial the games in Beijing uh, have already been and, and most assuredly will be. And I wondered, are you all, is it right to play working with, with Quake in, in the areas affected by the earthquake already? Well, actually, we have, we have started working with the Chinese government in China over a year ago uh, due to the Olympics because mm -hmm. we work in the uh, Olympic countries. Uh, and now we've been requested uh, to partner with them uh, to help in the trauma of the children affected by the earthquake. And I think this is a, a very important time where we can support uh, these millions of children which has been displaced mm -hmm. uh, in, this, uh, in these communities and also helping, I mean, many of them has been orphans and things. And, I, uh, and it's been a wonderful partnership with the Chinese government actually and knowing that they have such an interest to support the children in these communities, which is something we don't really hear about when we hear about the controversial side of the Chinese government and the Olympics. Um, you, when was the last time you skated? You strapped them on. I mean the oval. I don't mean like pleasure skating. <laughs> have, you the, have you done the oval in a while? No, I will actually. I went once this winter. I was home and uh, I had to 
to do it with very rarely I get on the ice anymore. Yeah. I have to say it's a, it's a, it's hard actually. It's a, not the the sport is so tough when you go in a skating position because you know all times you had good strong legs and it's not there anymore. It's just pretty thick thighs over there, buddy. I mean, you're still in shape, right? <laughs> like, I mean, you can't get one good. Let me, and, and, I mean, and, and, yeah, thank you. I mean, I, don't know. <laughs> I didn't say that, I didn't say they were toned. I said they were, you know, you know. You know, I mean, I, I, as somebody who I watch, I watch Olympic sports. Have you ever had a colossal crash in the oval? Because that looks like the scariest sporting accident. It is tough, and people have been really seriously injured as well. Uh, though, um, no, I have been exceptionally fortunate I never crashed. Uh, I mean, I crashed when I was a kid. I was actually more on the snow than I was on the ice. Yeah. Uh, though I probably that taught me how to skate, and I, I managed to stand there. You got a soccer ball there? This is for you. For me? Yeah, absolutely. This Good, is... because a full-size one, I wouldn't be able to kick it. No, I know. This is... Yeah. <laughs> we have mini balls, you know? For... <laughs> <laughs> so... <laughs> Listen, it's all over the internet now. Why hide? <laughs> our, our symbol is a red ball, and it uh, it's provides children the opportunity to play and to believe in the future. And it sells our philosophy, look after yourself, look after one another. And uh, we see that the children learning how to do that. And I want to thank you and to be an ambassador for Right to Play. No, so. Great to see you. Thank you. Real pleasure. Thank you. Johan Olofkoff, big fan of this organization. Go to writetoplay.com, writetoplay.com and see what they're doing. We'll be right back. <laughs>